Today I have with me a construction engineer who had a dream, a laptop, and a camera, and he traveled the world taking pictures of some of the most amazing construction sites in the world and telling the stories of construction companies. Aaron Witt and Dan Briscoe are here from BuildWit, and they're gonna talk about how they're focused on making the dirt world a better place, and they're also gonna tell us what they've learned about the civil engineering and construction industry and how companies in these industries are on a path that's not so great unless they take ownership and make some changes. Let's jump right in. All right, now I'd like to welcome on our guests for today's episode, Aaron Witt and Dan Briscoe of BuildWit. These guys are doing amazing things. I'm sure you've seen, if you're in the civil engineering world, I'm sure you've seen Aaron on a construction site somewhere around the world on LinkedIn. His videos are amazing. And Aaron, Dan, welcome to the Civil Engineering Podcast. Thanks. Appreciate you having us. So Aaron, let's kind of start off with you. You started BuildWit a little bit a while ago now, and you've done a lot of great stuff. You've got a big following, but tell us about yourself first. Tell us about your journey to how you got to starting Build With before we kind of dive in here. Uh, sure. Yeah. I, I, um, I grew up the son of a, a tax lawyer. So I was, you know, white collar, white collar upbringing in Scottsdale, Arizona, no affiliation with construction, building things, blue collar life whatsoever. But um, from a young age, just loved tractors, bulldozers, anything that pushed dirt for whatever reason. So my dad was doing some tax work for the local cat dealership, got lined up with some of the executives there, had my sixth birthday party at the cat dealer. And from then on, it was just totally, uh, I was just totally in love with construction and, and, and earth moving. So when it came time to start thinking about a career, when I was in high school, I started to really consider you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll go into engineering or construction or doing something in, in the, in the earth moving world. And coincidentally, there was a big earth moving, uh, well, it was an underground project. It was a, uh, there was a lot of dirt being moved, but it was for RCP for a drainage project in, in Phoenix in my neighborhood. And I would go watch it after school, after high school. And I called the owner of the company, asked to meet, talked to him about his career, how he got started, asked him for a job. And after asking for quite a few months, he gave me a job as a, as a laborer in the construction industry. So I started out in construction right after graduating high school. And I asked him, so what'd you study in college? Because I was going to college. That was just the natural thing you did. It was like going from fifth to sixth grade. You didn't think about it. And he said, construction engineering. And I said, great, I'll study construction engineering too. So I signed up for engineering school, not understanding the, the math that goes into engineering, completely ignorant to the fact that I had to do math for four years, brutal math. Um, and that was that. Was that. Wow, that's wild. I, I love that story because I've always found in doing a lot of the career coaching and just talking to engineers about their careers, when someone kind of follows what they like, they do much better, right? I mean, in the world of civil engineering, you can go into a million different disciplines, geotech, environmental, transportation. And, you know, it's one of those things, if you know you like something and you follow it, you tend to do much better. So you went to school for construction engineering. You did all that math, which I remember too many late nights in the lab. And, uh, and then you came out, you got into your career. How did that end up manifesting into build with? So I, I, studied engineering. The biggest thing was I wanted to stay out in the field while I did it. So every summer of school, I would work for a different construction company. So the first two summers I was a laborer, uh, just in the ditch with the shovel, no project management or anything like that. Just no different than anyone else out there. Then a mentor said, Hey, you need to go figure out how construction projects are run. So I became a field engineer intern for two really large, heavy civil construction companies, one on the railroad, one doing drilling and blasting. And then I graduated by the grace of God. I don't know how I actually graduated engineering school, but I did. They gave me a diploma. I have it in a safe. They can't take it from me now. And I went to work in road construction after school. So the plan was I wanted to do what Rich Pearson did. He owned a construction company. I wanted to own a construction company for nothing more than the selfish reason of my name being on heavy equipment, which meant that I would be able to get in that heavy equipment whenever I damn please. 
So my plan, go work in the construction industry, go get some experience, save up, go buy a backhoe a few years later, have at it. Um, but as I graduated and started working in the construction industry, I started to share photos and videos and, and my writing, my experiences about the industry online. It really started to take off. And that's when I got a call from Dan Briscoe saying, hey, you want to come down to work for this construction software company in Houston? We have a program called I Build America. We're trying to inspire the next generation. We'd love to have you. So I go down to work for the software company for a few months. My vision's different than the vision of some of the other folks there. And it gets to a point where I say, why can't I do this on my own? And that's when Build What begins in 2017, about four and a half years ago now. For those out there, I know a lot of people know you from your videos. Um, you're, you're all over the world, as I said earlier. You're this amazing machinery that you have in these videos. We see you standing next to these things that are 20 times the size of you. But for people that are only kind of seeing the videos and the pictures that you post, talk about what, what you do. What does Bill Wood do? I started really simply with a camera running around really any job site I could find in the United States to tell stories about the dirt world. The storytelling resonated with people. Um, we started to sell it as a means to inspire the next generation to solve these construction companies workforce problem. So we essentially over, over the next few years with the help of Dan built a marketing business exclusively focused on what we call the dirt world. And so that's excavation companies, infrastructure companies, any companies that use heavy equipment to do what they do. And then now we've gotten into software and training. So we asked ourselves, how do we scale our impact? How do we go make the whole dirt world a better place, which is what our mission is? The answer was we can't do it with just the marketing business. The marketing business and storytelling is critical, but we need to go beyond that. And we need to start educating the next generation and, and inspiring the next generation at a greater scale. So that's when we came up with something called Build It Training, which is a platform we've built for the dirt world from the ground up to train people like laborers, operators, field engineers, project managers on the basics of the industry and other things like leadership and safety and you know the structure of, of crews. And so we have beginning topics, intermediate topics, expert topics. And we've only been going for a few months now, but we already have 500 training videos on the platform with another 500 in the works over the next 60 days. So it's, it's really moving uh, and it's been a lot of fun. So we started with just a camera, taking pictures aimlessly, me, and grew into a marketing business. We still have the marketing business. It's going real strong. And now we have this software business, which has been a whole new frontier for us. That's awesome. And, and this is a good place to bring Dan in here to the conversation. Dan, talk to us a little bit about kind of, I guess, your role here in the company and over, over the years since you've been here. Yeah, I joined Aaron early on. He and I had a relationship. The first time somebody asked him for a website, he said, sure, I can do it. And then called me and we figured it out together. Uh, and then I've been here ever since just kind of, you know, I kind of working closely with Aaron every day. Where's the vision of the company going and, and helping run the company. I've had probably 10 different roles uh, as we start, we're small and then I've grown. I'm, I'm currently president of the company. Uh, I'm working with our leadership team just on those three different operations, the, the, the media company, the, the marketing agency, and now the software company. But that's what I do. So it's really, I guess, part of what you're focused on, Dan, is you had one service line and now you've kind of expanded to these other service lines and you're, you're trying to focus on growing those different lines. Is that right? Yeah, we've, and we've got a, a 10 person leadership team that is really running the business now. Aaron and I have been able to elevate, keep working on the vision, some special projects, partnerships, uh, raising some capital, things like that. But uh, so he and I have been able to do that. But I, I work, he travels around and, and is, you know, uh, telling stories of the dirt world. I stay back in the home office working with those, that 10 person leadership team. I'm kind of running the business. Awesome. Sounds like a good uh, duo back and forth. Good, good teamwork there. So Aaron, you, you mentioned make the dirt world a better place as the mission. Talk about how having a mission like that can really be helpful in guiding a business. I, uh, since we've built our business upon a mission, I don't, I wouldn't want to do it any other way. Um, it's, 
it's essential to have kind of a North star why for anybody to be here. And if you were to ask anybody in this office right now, why you're here, you would hear immediately, we're here to make the dirt world a better place. But what, what does that mean? It, it goes back first to the importance of the dirt world and recognizing that society, no, no matter where you're at in society, society could not function without the dirt world. Whether you're flushing the toilet, taking a shower, turning the lights on, driving somewhere, living in a house at the foundation, flying somewhere. I mean, internet, everything, everything in our built world relies upon infrastructure. And the reality is the infrastructure world, the dirt world, the companies creating the infrastructure are not equipped for the future right now. And they're not equipped from a, a methodology stand. I mean, I don't mean that from a methodology standpoint or a technology standpoint, but it's from a human being standpoint. They don't have the human capital they need to make sure that they can build the infrastructure society needs well into the future. So that is the, the problem we've zeroed in on is there's a lot of other companies out there helping make company, you know, construction companies estimating more effective and takeoffs more effective and accounting software and equipment telematics and GPS or whatever it is. But there's no one from a digital standpoint focused on how do we grow people in the dirt world? How do we inspire the next generation? How do we create pathways? How do we take someone from a laborer to an operator? How do we take someone from the field to the office? So those are the questions we're, we're trying to create an answer to from a digital standpoint is, is how, do we, how do we solve the, the industry's workforce problem so that instead of having the exact same conversation we've been having for years now, five years, 10 years down the road, we can instead be asking ourselves, great, we solved this people problem. We have all these great people. How can we build more sustainably? How can we build more effectively? How can we better serve society? There's other questions we could be answer, asking and answering, but until we figure out this people thing, nothing else matters. So that's what our business is focused on. And that's how we're making the dirt world a better place. If we can help the industry solve this people problem, a problem that no one really has a good answer to right now, that's going to make the dirt world a better place. If we make the dirt world a better place, then the dirt world can serve society and the future generations for many, many, many years to come. But right now it is uncertain. And the problem is we don't have that option to be uncertain. We can't just tell society, hey guys, sorry, we can't provide you clean water anymore. We can't build roads for you anymore. We can't design strong foundations for you. That's just, that's not an option. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, and I really like, you know, it's great to have a niche like that, to be able to focus in on it and really understand the challenges of that niche and then try to solve them. I think that that's where I mean, I've seen that in our world with the civil engineering firms that we work with, but I see a lot of businesses trying to expand too much across different um, industries and, you know, you can't get as granular as you are. And I think the other part that's fascinating to me about it is if you want to understand people's problems, you need to go out and talk to those people. And, you know, if anyone looks at your social media they know that you're out there talking to people, I mean, you're all over the place talking to people. Um, right on their sites with them, which is awesome. And so that kind of leads into my next question. Dan talked a little bit about the leadership of the company, but obviously for you, you know, your job is to be out there. I mean, we all see that. That's the very visible side of build with, you know, how are you able to do that and then still kind of work with the leaders and, you know, keep, you know, think about the visionary side of this. How do you manage, you know, being out there, being the, the public figure of the company, but then also being such an important leader? Uh, that's a great question. I'm still trying to figure that one out. So if you can help me figure that out, let me know. Um, it, it's it's tough. It's like I, I it's like doing two completely different jobs. I have two essentially completely different careers. I travel and travel. You need to be focused on wherever you're at, and you don't oftentimes have the option of being focused or not. You can't be taking calls in a coal mine. It, it just doesn't work in North Dakota. You know, you're you're freezing. You can't even take your damn gloves off in in the winter. So you can't be answering the phone while you're on a coal mine. If you're on a coal mine, you're on a coal mine. So when I have to, when I travel, I'm really present with wherever I'm at. And then when I'm back in the office, it's nice because I don't have the distraction of the field or anything like that. I can be really present with, with where I'm at and our team here. The key that I've found is I, I am very trusting and I don't have a choice in the matter really to be where I'm at. I'm, I, I'm able to go serve the field and go experience the field like I am because I have people like Dan that I wholeheartedly trust and that are executing and that are guiding our business back home when I'm gone. So I'm not stressed out when I'm on a coal mine or next week when I'm up in the oil sands in, in Canada, 
I'm not stressed because I have really phenomenal people. You know, Dan is, is, is at the top, but there's a lot of other people beyond Dan that I wholeheartedly trust to go execute and are honestly better at executing than I ever could, could be on my own. So I've just stayed in my lane. How can I be most valuable to the business? What can I do that no one else can do here? Traveling is, is that answer for sure. And then allow everybody else to go do what they were hired to do, what they're an expert at, what they are gifted in, in doing. So I think that's the biggest thing is I've learned. Well, I, I've really had no choice. I've just, I just trust people to do what they do. And that goes back. You can look at our values. Like one of our values is make decisions. We try to give people the information they need and then try to allow them to make the decisions themselves. So even Dan back home, he's not calling a lot of the shots. It's the leaders below him. And then it's not even the leaders below him. It's sometimes and oftentimes the leaders below him. So that's how we've been able to pull it off so far. Yeah, that's great. And, and, and Dan, I would imagine on your end of that equation for you, you know, it's really thinking through, you know, when Aaron is in the office with you, there's certain things that you guys really got to run on and accomplish. And then, you know, he's going to be gone for a while. So then you've got to plan accordingly. And that way, I would imagine that that's a big part of your planning. Yeah. I mean, and Aaron's humble, but he, he, he's a very good CEO. He reads a ton of books. He works on his own leadership, setting the vision for the company. Um, but then, yeah, he's hired. We've, we've, we've over-invested in a leadership team. Uh, so yeah, when he's home, we kind of, you know, we talk a couple times a day, at least once a day when he's traveling, uh, when he's home, we might work on more projects. We kind of plan that out. Oh, I'll, I'll be in the office for two days. So let's, let's get together to kind of solve these things. Um, but yeah, we, that's, that's, we just, we got a strong leadership team and we trust them. Um, you know, they we're, we're pretty adamant that they need to have their number twos and they need to have their structure in place. And, and then we trust them to go do the work. That's great. And so let's get back to the construction industry for a second, Aaron. A lot of our listeners are civil engineering professionals, civil engineering firm leaders. They work with construction companies every day. Um, that's either their clients or, you know, teaming up with them on projects. You mentioned that, you know, a lot of these companies aren't set up for the future. Um, what are some of the things that you see construction companies maybe not doing right? Some of the typical pitfalls that you can talk a little bit about to educate our listeners that when they're talking with them, or maybe they can even help them or guide them a little bit. Can you talk about some of the pitfalls you've seen in the construction industry? I just think the, the biggest pitfall is continuing uh, the status quo. I think a lot of construction companies right now are, are comfortable. They've been making a lot of money over the past few years. The, the past decade has been really good for construction, even through COVID. Everybody's been going and going. Everybody has their biggest backlog ever. Everybody is probably hitting some of the highest revenue numbers they've hit before. It's a really, really good time. So there is not very much incentive to innovate right now, to think differently, to go invest in people differently, to, to tell their story differently. But that's exactly what needs to happen. We need to start doing things differently. And it's not dramatic. We don't need to go crazy. But it's something as simple as thinking that this next generation is just going to show up on our doorstep, knock on the door and ask for a job. It's not happening. It's not happening because they don't, they don't even know construction exists. So how can they go work for an industry they don't totally understand exists? So it's something as simple as, hey, guys, I know we haven't really said anything online, but we should probably think about doing that. Because if we want to talk about the next generation, everybody's so quick to say, oh, high schools and middle schools and lower school, you know, whatever school. It's like, that's great. But I can reach all the schools, every kid in the United States on my phone every single day of the week. So we should probably start there first. That's a really easy place to start. So I think the, the biggest pitfall the industry has, has fallen into right now is everything's been really good and there has been very few incentives to actually change and actually ask themselves, how can we better invest in our people? How can we recruit differently? How can we tell our story? How can we make this career a little bit more sustainable? And, and I think once we start asking those questions and then actually doing things to address those problems and address those questions, the problem is going to start to solve itself. And this isn't just theory. We've seen a lot of construction companies do this very successfully that don't have workforce problems right now. Everybody else has workforce problem, but they've taken responsibility for it. They've created training programs. They've told their story. They've inspired the next generation. They've built a whole new workforce. They've built a great culture. And miraculously, they don't have a retention problem. 
they don't have a hiring problem. So it's possible. Now it's, we just need to do it at scale. And what construction companies don't understand is they all think they're out for themselves because it's so competitive. You're always bidding against each other. So it's put everybody on their own little island. But we need to understand as, as an industry, we're all on the same team here. So until, even if I figure this out, until all of my other competitors figure this out, until the industry figure this is, figures this out, we're still going to be engaged in this race to the bottom. So to answer the question, I think it's just continuing down the path. Everybody's continued down. And until we start to do things differently, it's unreasonable to expect this next generation to come to work for us. Yeah, I mean, it's, I see a lot of parallels between like the civil engineering consulting firms that we work with and the construction companies that you're talking about is that the civil world's been good. All these projects, they're designing them. They've been having some of a lot of our clients say, hey, it was our best year ever last year or the year before. But at the same time, we're starting to hear from people. We, we can't find enough people to hire. There are not enough engineers out there. And so, you know, to the same thing that you're doing, you know, people, there's a lot of jobs out there today, like, you know, coding and other things, computer science that people are gravitating towards. Young kids are getting pushed into. They're seeing it all the time. And industries like construction, like engineering, they're kind of not as sexy, if you will, anymore to some of these younger children, unless we make them that way and we put them out there. And so I think what you're doing is great. I think if you're, if you're a leader of a civil engineering firm, you need to be thinking about the same thing that Aaron is talking about in construction and engineering. That's the reason that all these firms are telling us that they're so busy, but they can't hire enough people. Well, at the end of the day, with infrastructure funding, you're going to get more projects and you're going to have less people. And so the equation's not getting any better unless we do something about it in terms of you know educating and innovating a little bit. And another question that I have for you, and, and you know, both of you can can take this one for sure. You know, Aaron, it's been what four or five years as you started up the company. What have you learned, both of you, in the way of startup? Like, what are some startup lessons that you've learned in building a company that maybe you could share with our listeners? Aaron, maybe you could kick us off. I don't think we have time for that. It's it's been a <laughs> it's it's been a, a heck of an education because I've never I've never started a company before. I've never worked at a startup. Dan, you know, he's worked at startups in the past a little bit, but still has limited experience, has never built a company before. So we're, we're completely new at this. And, and I think that's been one of the biggest lessons learned is you just have to try things. And when you screw up, take ownership of it. Transparency wins is another one of our values. You know, transparency wins, do what's right is another value. You know, lean on our values, talk about our failings transparently, make things right at the end of the day and just keep moving on down the road. I think it's been the biggest thing for us has just been forward pro progress. We, we, we've, I think, fallen into a lot more traps than we probably realize just because we were so focused on, all right, what's the next step? What's the next step? What's the next step? Just plunging into the unknown over and over and over and over again that we didn't, we didn't really think twice about it. So I think that's been the biggest thing for us. And, and people ask, oh, did you th see this whole training thing? When you started, absolutely not. The whole training conversation came into play, you know, early last year. We were years into our business before training came into play. And then the software play was even further than that. Becoming a software company, that was never our initial intent. But by doing, by trying, by experiencing the industry repeatedly, by asking people, what's your, what's your problem? What's your problem? What's your problem? We then were able to see, hey, we think we might be able to build a solution for this. And we wouldn't have gotten to that conclusion without trying and failing and just every single step, you know, every day making one more step, two more steps and going on down the path to then reveal this, this bigger picture on the horizon. So I think that's been one of my, I mean, there's a lot of lessons, but that's been one of the big ones is I think there's this, this weird misconception that when you start a business, you have to have the plan day one. I didn't have any plan day one. I've never had a business plan. And then two, that there's this along the way, some bolt of inspiration where it all just makes sense. Nothing makes sense still. Nothing makes sense. But because we've just shown up every day and done our best every day, we've started to create something substantial. But that didn't exist day one. It didn't exist year two. It's just been through uh, an iterative process. 
anything to add, Dan, on your end of things? Yeah, yeah you know, I think, I think we both, Aaron and I both dream big. Uh, we, we had his mission and, and adopted it for the company. We dreamed big that we could actually go, you know, help change an industry. Uh, you know, having focus, we had a laser focus on the heavy civil world, um, kind of the earth moving. So that, that was, that was focused, but within that, we, we tried a lot of different things. And so I, lessons learned to, you know, focus on something, get it, get it done well, um, um, dream big, you know, it, I don't know. It, I, I think the best thing we did was just stay humble, admit, hey, we don't know exactly know what we're doing. We're making this up as we go along. We're trying to do the right thing. We'll, if we screw up, we'll admit it. We'll tell you. We'll refund your money if we need to. Uh, but we're, we're going to learn this together. And so far, that's, that's earned us a lot of grace as a company because we definitely screw up. Uh, but people still seem to root for us and jump on board because we're, we're transparent about it. That's awesome. And it sounds like from everything you've, you've told us here so far, you know, finding an industry that you're familiar with that has problems that you can help them solve and really building a great leadership team for some things that you've done at build with that has really helped you to be successful. And, you know, Dan's comments are just reminded me, I was just reading a kind of a, an article on company culture and they said Facebook's motto originally was move fast and break things. That was kind of like their message to the employees. And I kind of, Dan reminded me a little bit there of that when he said, you know, try it. If it doesn't work, do something different, you know, as opposed to another company that might move slow for whatever reason and, you know, take extra care. So everyone's different, but it, you know, I've certainly learned some stuff from you guys. What we're going to do here is we're going to take a, a quick break. We're going to come back and finish it off with a couple of career related questions that we're going to rattle off with the guys here. So stick with us. And we'll be right back. All right. I am back with Aaron Witt and Dan Briscoe of BuildWit. We've had an interesting conversation about BuildWit and its growth and how it's really focused on working in the construction industry and making the construction industry a better place, right? Make the dirt world a better place. And what we're going to do here is we're going to put them both on what we like to call the civil engineering hot seat. And we're going to rattle off a couple of career related questions to wrap this episode up. So Aaron, I'm going to start with you. Do you have any specific rituals or routines that you practice every day? Something that you do in the mornings, at lunch, anything that you do regularly that has kind of helped you with your success in your career? I would say two things. I work out every day. I think the human body, you got to wring out the rag. So first thing in the morning, no matter how well I'm feeling or where I'm at in the world or whatever it is, how hot, cold, raining, I work out every day. Uh, it doesn't have, I don't have to kill myself, but it, it's some, there's something to be said for physical movement daily. And then I think another thing I've done that's really helped is regular. It's not daily, but it's probably biweekly therapy, which has been an enormous, enormous help for me as a human being and a business owner and, and just, uh, you know, man in general. So I would recommend if anything, I, I couldn't be getting by without daily physical activity and regular therapy. That's great. Dan, how about you? A uh, couple of secrets, maybe eight hours of sleep. I, I work much better. I don't always get it, but probably 90% of the time get eight hours of sleep. So that's good. And then I, I try and do my most important projects first thing in the morning I, uh, with a cup of coffee. That's my best time for thinking. Uh, so I save it. I get those done. I save things to the afternoon that, that are a little bit you know, easier to do. Um, that's, that's, so every morning I'm looking, what, what are the, what's the big thing I'm going to tackle today? Awesome. Awesome. All right. Next question. And I'll start with you on this one, Dan. Um, obviously I know this could be a tough question because there's hundreds of and thousands of really good books out there, but throughout the course of your career, maybe, you know, your time at BuildWit, has there maybe been a book that stood out for you in terms of helping you personally, professionally that you kind of lean on? I know every so often we read a book and I know I have a couple, I've highlighted them. I keep opening them up. Is there one that stuck out for you or you can name more than one if you have to, but just, I like to ask this question. Yeah, we, we actually talked about this on our, our leadership team and, and what books Aaron and I read a lot. He, he actually reads more than I do, but I, I would say there's two that we told our company, let, let's standardize on this. And it was extreme ownership with Jocko Willink. 
and Everybody Matters with Bob Chapman and, and his group there. So it's um, two very different books, but focus leadership and, and how, you know, how that impacts the company. So th those are two that I, I really rely on. That's awesome. I mean, extreme ownership. I mean, we've done over 500 episodes and that one seems to be coming up quite a bit on the last like 10, 15 episodes. It's been repeated quite a bit. So it's good to hear everyone. Aaron, obviously you're on board with those two. Any other ones you want to add in? Yeah, those are the two big ones. I actually have a meeting with Bob Chapman this week, which I'm really excited about. Um, the, the, the one book that, that changed the course for me in early on in business was Conscious Capitalism. And that proved that business isn't just necessarily out for profit. It's a lot better when it's, hey, you make money, but you do good with it at the same time, which is where of the foundation of our business came about is, hey, why can't we make money? And make the make the world a better place while we while we do it. Those things go hand in hand. That's awesome. So, Aaron, next question here: As throughout your career, you've obviously had managers that you've worked for. When you think back to those managers, and maybe you had a favorite, you don't have to name names. When you think of your favorite or a couple of favorite managers, what was in that? What made them your favorite? We're just trying to understand in the world of leadership and management. You know, what do you feel makes for a great leader? I think someone that that um, sincerely cares about the people they lead. And I, I'm unique because I, I mean, I had managers, but it was always temporary or I was an intern or something like that. I, I've never I've never been at a job for more than a few months, which is kind of funny, um, a full time job for more than a few months. So I've never had any kind of consistency when it comes to managers. And, and I quit my job, my last full-time job when I was 22 years old. So since 22, I've been going on my own, but I guess to answer this question from another angle, I focused on being very, very, very caring um, and being, and, and just recognizing the importance of having the opportunity to lead people in the first place. And, and just understanding the gravity of that and, and taking it as a really serious responsibility that I've been and dealt in life. So I think that's where at least I approach management. I don't know if it's good or not, but how can I care for my people more deeply and how can I show them I care more deeply? And then how can I keep that in the back of my mind? The fact that this is a, an extraordinary responsibility and I need to treat it as such. That's awesome. That's really, that's really powerful. That's great. Dan, how about you on your end? Was there a manager or someone that, you know, had a big impact on you that helped you like understand, like, you know, this is what, this is how you really can lead people. Yeah. I've, I've actually, so I've, I've had a 30 year career work for a lot of different managers, both good and bad. And I learned equally from both of them, just learned what not to do from bad managers. But I think what differentiates the good from the bad for me is, the bad managers cared about themselves and how, how they looked and what they were going to accomplish. And we were there to support them. The good managers were there to support us, to support our career, support the objectives for the team, uh, would do anything for you type of, a, and, and really focused on getting the team to get, getting the most out of the team. Uh, so that's, you know, it, it goes back to what Aaron said is caring, uh, but they cared more about you and the mission than they did necessarily about their career. Um, and that came through. That's awesome. All right, last question. And I'll, I'll start with you first, Dan. If you were to get into an elevator with a young professional, let's say in the heavy civil world, based on what you've learned so far in your time at BuildWit, everything that you've seen out there, you have 30 to 40 seconds with that person. What career advice would you give them in terms of building a career in this industry from what you've learned? Yeah, I, you know, I, I go build something, go be part of something, learn as you go, and then don't don't be afraid to take chances. Like I, I think, I think the mistakes I see where people just, oh, I, I got to go down this path because that's what everybody did before me. Um, best thing I ever did was leave big companies and come to a startup with Aaron uh, and do something different. So don't be afraid to take chances. Uh, go go be part of something. Go build something. Uh, learn as you go. Awesome, Aaron. How about you? I, I tell young people that there are so many opportunities in the blue collar space right now. It is wild. So jump in. And like Dan said, don't be afraid to, to, Hey, this didn't work out, but give it your all first. I think young people, they, 
and, and I am way unqualified to answer this question, by the way, but I think they one need to work a little bit more. And if you work a little bit more, then you're even that much further ahead of everybody in this world of immense opportunity. So at that point, the world is your oyster. So if you're taking extreme ownership, if you're working as hard as you possibly can, but the place you work still sucks, then go somewhere else. Don't, don't look at it like you're stuck there forever. And I, all these people reach out to me online all the time. I'm like, hey, I've, I've really given this my best shot, but I'm a little worried about leaving. And, and I ask them, well, how old are you? Oh, 24. I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? I know it's scary to go take a leap and go somewhere, but, but come on. Like I'm talk to, I, I, I talk to business owners every day. Oh, we can't find people. We can't find people. Like take the leap. Now's the time to do it. So that's at least the advice I would give. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I like, I like the advice from both of you guys. You know, I think I always tell engineers that if you're not uncomfortable in your career, you're probably not pushing yourself hard enough. You're probably not broadening your horizons and you're probably not growing at the end of the day. And that sounds a lot like what you guys are saying in terms of taking risks, taking a leap of faith and getting out there and trying things. And I agree with Aaron there, the amount of opportunities that I see out there in the civil infrastructure world are unbelievable. And I think there's only going to be more. Um, and, you know, you're in the right place at the right time, but it's up to you ultimately to kind of take ownership of that, develop your skills and look for those opportunities. So I want to thank Aaron Witt, Dan Briscoe of BuildWit for coming on. You can check out everything they're doing at buildwit.com. You can also follow BuildWit on LinkedIn, connect with these guys on LinkedIn. And Aaron's literally all over the world. I'm, I'm not just saying that he's all over the world, literally looking at the most amazing machinery as a civil engineer. I, I love checking out his stuff all the time. So guys, Thanks so much for spending some time on the Civil Engineering Podcast. It was really great to get to catch up with you guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Civil Engineering Podcast on YouTube produced by the Engineering Management Institute. We're always looking for new ways to help engineers become effective managers and leaders. You can view all of our content on our website at engineeringmanagementinstitute.org and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel here for our weekly videos. Until next time, please continue to engineer your own success.